Thanks very much and good afternoon everybody, members, officers, um, those who are with us um, joining remotely and any members of the public um, who are viewing this meeting. So this is the meeting of the Climate Change and Environment Advisory Committee and I'm Councillor Pippa Halings and I'm the chair of this committee. Um, and for the information of members of the public, our committee advises Cabinet on the actions required to achieve the Council's target on climate change and its environmental commitments. Um, and may I ask those who are joining us remotely to ensure their camera and microphone remain off unless they're addressing the committee. Um, and so just to note, I think it would be really good to go around the room, see who's in the room and also who's joining us um, virtually as well. So as I said, I'm Councillor Pippa Halings, member for Histon and Beaton and Orchard Park, and I have my two vice chairs. Um, Thank you, Chef. Councillor Jeff Harvey, I'm the member for Portion. Uh, Councillor Martin Khan, I'm one of the members for Histon and Beaton. Thank you very much. And we also have... So I would just like to... Oh, hello, Lisa. Well done. Mm -hmm. Councillor Red <laughs> <laughs> arrived just on time. Um, before um, Councillor Warren Green introduces herself, we would like to note that um, Councillor Paul Bear Park um, has left the committee and we want to thank him for all the time that he's spent and the time that he's dedicated to the committee and we're really happy to have Councillor Warren Green Tilly to be joining us, which is wonderful. And if you'd like to, yeah, Councillor, I'm Councillor Natalie Warren Green. I um, my ward is Long Stanton. Thank you very much. And we go through. Mm -hmm. And we also have Councillor. Sorry, Bunty Waters Barhill Ward. Thank you very much. Um, and we also have uh, Councillor Heather Williams, and I represent the Mordens Ward, and substituting for Councillor Bhattacharya. And for some reason, the microphones want to link up to wallets, so be careful. <laughs> and thank you. Uh, hi, good afternoon. I'm Councillor Lisa Redruff, and I'm a member for Harston and Congerton Ward. Thank you very much. And in <coughs> terms of officers as well. Hi, uh, Alex Snelling Day, uh, Waste Policy, Climate and Environment Lead at South Cams. Thank you very much. And... Uh, John Cornell, Natural Environment Team Leader, Greater Cayman Shared Plan. Thank you very much. And I'm Jane Green, the Built and Natural Environment Manager, overseeing all the three disciplinary teams we've got um, from the Shared Planning Service as well. Thank you very much. And we have joining us online. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lee Cordington. I'm a Project Officer in the Climate and Environment Team. Thank you very much. And we have Councillor Brian Milnes, I think. <laughs> Yes, so the, uh, Brian Milnes, uh, Deputy Leader and uh, Lead Member for Environment on the Cabinet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. And here also together with us. Hello, Lawrence Murray Homan. I'm Democratic Services for the Climate and Environment Advisory Committee. Thank you very much. And we also have, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we have Patrick Adams, who is also in absolutely invaluable support um, to everybody and to the committee so thank you very much yes and we also have um, Orla Gibbons project officer climate and environment team thank you very much Orla thank you very much um, and it's it's really good to note that um, South Cams has recently been accredited as a bronze carbon literate, literate organization by the Carbon Literacy Project. And this was one of the things in the review in terms of the climate leagues that was looking at how much South Cams was investing in training up of its officers on climate and environment issues, which is what they call carbon literacy. So it's really good to know that that investment's made and that we've got the bronze level in terms of bronze carbon literature organization, which is um, really good. And yesterday it was also very interesting to be at the Action on Energy um, meeting together with Alex who was there um, and colleagues also from Cambridge City Council to look at issues around retrofitting the challenge and what we should be doing around that so th those are key things so if we move to the agenda 
We have the first item, which will be apologies. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I've received three apologies today from Councillors Sanford, Ariel Khan and Bhattacharya, and Councillor Heather Williams has kindly stepped in the sub for Councillor Bhattacharya. Thank you. Thank you very much. And in num I agenda item two is declarations of interest for any of the items on the agenda. Thank you. Um, and then we go to agenda item three, which is minutes of the previous meeting. So does anybody have any comments on the minutes of the previous meeting? No, we don't have any comments, so those are approved. Thank you very much. And then we'll go to the substantive items on the agenda, which are two items. Um, and the first one is in terms of biodiversity net gain and an update on the actions in support of biodiversity net gain and our aspiration of the 20% of biodiversity net gain in support of our doubling nature um, ambitions and aspirations. So I think, John, John Cornell, you're going to take us through this. Um, report. Thank you very much, Chair. I will share my screen and um, share a short presentation that I've put together on what we've done thus far with Biodiversity Net Gain. Um, if it wants to play, there we go. So, Biodiversity Net Gain uh, is a new duty for all councils in England and um, came out of the Environment Act in uh, 2021. I'm going to give a little bit of background before we get into the actual detail of what we've done over the last 12 to 18 months um, in the Council. So, as I'm sure you're aware, um, valuing nature is a very important part of the work we do at the Council. Uh, natural systems link up with the economics of our lives and ecosystem services such as cycling water, pollinating crops, climate regulation, that kind of thing. And in fact, according to the ONS, the government's uh, very own uh, Office of National Statistics. Uh, natural capital was valued in 2020, so it's a couple of years old, um, at 1.8 trillion. Um, and just to give some perspective, UK GDP in the same year was 2.3 trillion. So that gives you a, a sense of the kind of uh, importance of natural capital uh, to us and to our economy. If you put in, um, include uh, health benefits associated with outdoor recreation, um, newly estimated cultural service in the UK is estimated about 600 billion, again, for 2020. So just a little bit of background on that. And for those of you that don't know what natural capital is, um, it's one of those, those terms. Natural capital defines the stocks of natural assets, which include geology, soil, air, water, and all of the living things um, in creation, right? So uh, it's from this natural capital that we can drive a wide range of services, often called ecosystem services which make our lives possible or more comfortable. So that's a little bit from, from government ONS, but what about our residents? Uh, what about the people? Um, so according to Ipsos, Ipsos is a, a recognised a polling agency. According to them, in August 2023, the index uh, for public concern about climate change and the environment doubled to become the third joint biggest issue facing the UK. One in four Britons viewed the environment as an important issue for the country in August. Now, I must say, I've had a look today, and the September data is a little bit different, so there's some movement, but this gives an indication that our residents feel climate and environment is up there with things like the NHS, immigration, these other very important issues for us all. So, where are we? We're in South Cairns, aren't we? And um, South Cambridgeshire is a very diverse place. There are some pictures of Cambridge City in there because, of course, I work for the, the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service, which does include the city of Cambridge. It's a very diverse place with villages, farmland, urban development, all kinds of stuff. If we look at it from an air photo taken in the summer, we could look at this and arguably say, well, that looks very green. What's the problem? Lots of green, lots of green there. Very green. Um, however, most of that's farmland. And in fact, Cambridgeshire, South Cams, has a very, very low percentage of land managed for nature. So it's deceptive that when we look around us and we see lots of green fields and trees, it all looks like it's fabulous, but actually it's very, very nature depleted. And to overlay on top of this, um, this is a, from our first proposals for the new local plan. 
this is just the sense of the kinds of development pressure that we have um, on the fringe within the district of, of South Cambridgeshire. Um, I would ask my policy colleagues to maybe make the, the text a little bit larger because it's difficult for me to read. But the take home from this slide is that the expected development uh, between now and uh, 2050, 2060 is about 60,000 homes and all kinds of other uh, development in terms of jobs and, and economies. So we live in a region, we live in an area which is uh, very, very, has very, very high uh, development pressure and we live in an area and region which has a very, very low uh, starting point for biodiversity. And those two things are critical when you, when you uh, think about what, what we're trying to do. So why biodiversity gain, um, net gain, why now, is, is what the slide says. Um, I've already mentioned ecosystem services. And from my list down there in the bottom left, some of those are ecosystem services, but some of them are just about quality placemaking. Remember that me and my team sit within the planning department and planning is about quality placemaking. It's not about volume house building. Very important if we're considering biodiversity and green infrastructure. So quality placemaking, um, some of the ecosystem services that are delivered through biodiversity net gain include air quality, uh, flood resilience, uh, as I've said before, green infrastructure, access to green infrastructure from by our residents, uh, climate and biodiversity emergencies, which have been um, called on by both councils, microclimate shading, mental health. I mean, this list goes on and on. It's not an exhaustive list. This is just an indication of the kinds of benefits that we can see coming forward through uh, biodiversity net gain and its associated benefits. So what is biodiversity net gain? For those of you that maybe don't know, and I will read from the screen because otherwise I'll, I'll just destroy it, but essentially it's an approach to development that aims to leave the natural environment in a measurably better state than it was before the development took place. And this approach to net gain supersedes the slightly older approach and that was called no net loss. And no net loss was a model that said, if we're going to develop here, we're going to ensure that we don't lose any biodiversity at the end of it. It's, it's going to be a, a net loss um, uh, model. And that actually never worked. It never worked. We always ended up losing a little bit of quality to the area. And so net gain tries to say, we will add 10%, 20% if it's, if it's actually something we're, we're going for in our local plan, our new local plan is looking at 20%. Um, we're going to put back more than we took. And that way, we don't just protect our environment, we actually enhance it and we begin to double nature and do the things that we've, we've, we've sought to do. So that's what biodiversity in that game BMG is. And this nature recovery is about just about stepping beyond simply conservation into active restoration of the natural world and halting the decline of the species abundance by 2030. That's what it is. We've had um, a lot of help from national policy going back about a decade, the Lawton Review 2010, Making Space for Nature. It was really guidance more than anything else. Uh, the government's uh, Green Future, so 25-year environment plan, National Planning Policy Framework, which actually does set out regulations and it, it includes net gain. Unhelpfully though, when uh, net gain was first brought forward in the NPPF, there wasn't a figure. It was just net gain. So that that meant that if you were a developer, you could do 1%, and that's fine. You could do 10%. What the Environment Act did in 2021 is it said for the first time, no, you will deliver a minimum 10% net gain. And that's what we've got coming down the pipe very, very soon. So the national policy has been there to help us and continues to. But locally, we've had a lot of help as well. So the doubling nature strategy from this council in 2021 set out some bold visions for how we wanted to double nature. Um, the biodiversity supplementary planning document from 2022, adopted by this council and City of Cambridge, again, put a little bit more detail um, on the guidance. And of course, that last, um, that last picture there is uh, the front cover of our emerging, not sure how many years out we are, but uh, the local plan, which has um, climate change, biodiversity, well-being, great places at the heart. So the policy is there to support it, whether it's local or national. These are the key components, if you like, of biodiversity net gain. So the Town and Country Planning Act will be amended. A minimum of 10% will be required. 
habitat would be secured for at least 30 years, delivered on-site or off-site or by a new statutory credit system or the National Register. It doesn't change existing protections for important habitats and species. It maintains the mitigation hierarchy. It's all good stuff, all quite straightforward and all measured um, in a standardised way. The timeline I touched on already. Um, November 2021, the Environment Act uh, came forward. Um, and there was a transition period of two years. And we were expecting that two-year transition to culminate this November, so next month, in the laying of secondary legislation, in the production of guidance, and essentially the starting gun for 10% net gain. And what's happened is over the summer, the government have had a bit of a think, and they said, well, no, no, it, we're not going to do this in November. It, the starting gun for this is going to be January 2024, However, the secondary legislation is still being laid before Parliament in November. The guidance is still coming out in November. And so the delay of two months is not worrying us at all. We think we're, we, are gonna, we are carrying on the momentum, the inertia behind what we've been building to for the last two years is not going to be affected by a two-month delay, with Christmas in the middle, by the way. So we're not viewing this as some uh, catastrophe. Um, so, so this is yeah the, the timeline, the transition period. Within that transition period, the last two years, essentially we've done an awful lot of work. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we have done and that's contained within the report that I submitted to uh, the committee. So uh, starting off, we, gosh, going back two years, we secured, managed to secure funding from the Department of Farming and Rural Affairs to essentially pay for additional resources because the new burden for the Council of Biodiversity Net Gain is not something that we can deliver with existing resources. There's just no way. Um, so we secured that funding. On the basis of that, we were able to hire a second ecologist onto the team, full-time, permanent post, to help us deliver that, that BNG a new burden. We've um, developed and delivered training for planners. Um, members are coming. It is coming, <laughs> but we've delivered um, training to planners from actually across the county, not just within uh, Greater Cambridge. We did a, an event back in, uh, in July. Um, we've been working with our policy colleagues to deliver, uh, develop, sorry, uh, BNG policy to ensure that um, what's in the new policies in the local plan reflects things like 20% and not 10, and uh, that's, that's ongoing work. We've recently put an HLF bid in, uh, Heritage Ultimately Fund, sorry, a bid for parish engagement post because we recognise that parishes are really, you know, it's, it's okay if we get our ducks lined up, but the parish is a little bit out in the cold. We want to support them. We can't really do it with existing resource, and so we've asked for some money for Heritage Lottery uh, to get that, that new post in. Uh, we're looking at systems, data, to ensure that we can manage the BNG data as it comes in from planning applications. Um, we've developed an off-site approach, which we brought to um, uh, the council, I think, last June, that was passed. So we, we now have a, an idea of how we're going to deal with BNG, whether it's on-site or off-site. We've recently signed our first uh, Section 106 agreement with a Habitat Bank at Lower Valley Farm, which is owned by the county council. And that will act as a strategic location where uh, biodiversity credits can be purchased for developers who cannot deliver on-site, although on-site is, of course, always the first and preferred option. Um, we are in the process of developing a BNG pre-app service for, development, uh, for developers, applicants who seek uh, more information, don't have the information they need, so that's up and running, I think, from November. And, of course, finally, we're working, we have been working with other councils. So all of the stuff that we're doing, um, we're not doing it in, um, on our own. We're working, we're talking to Hunts, we're talking to County, we're talking to the other districts to ensure it's joined up and that we can actually help them in some regards, whether it's through training or resource or, or whatever it is. So that's a little bit on what we've been doing. Um, important to say this work is ongoing. Um, we need to secure ongoing funding, whether it's through DEFRA. And we have funding from DEFRA for next year. But of course, this, <laughs> this won't end. We're going to have to make sure that this thing pays for itself. Um, we have to manage the, the BNG process because from January, you know, that's when the 
that's when the, uh, the, the fun and games start. And we have to ensure that we're managing it in a, in a measured and uh, transparent uh, process. We have to train staff and members so that there's a broad understanding of what this means for local, uh, local councils. Secure new Section 106 agreements, um, continue to help our policy colleagues develop policy and again, work and support other councils. And so, in a nutshell, rather large nutshell maybe, that's what we've been doing and that's what we're hoping to do uh, going forward. Busy time, um, but very rewarding and hopefully um, useful. Any questions? Thank you so much. So um, opening that up for questions and as well um, with a cabinet member online as well, Councillor Brian Mills, if you wanted to ask any questions. Um, let's start with Councillor Kalisa Redbrook. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you for that report. It's really good to hear. Um, I noticed in your report that it said that data storage was going to be really critical to how, the, how this worked. And I just wondered um, kind of what systems you had for that and um, how it works with sort of baseline, I guess, to make sure that that we, we're clear on and when what the baseline is before somebody comes in to do some work and whether there's any scope for the public to help pr provide that data. Thank you. Great question. Um, so I'll take that as a two-parter. Um, the first part on systems, um, we were exploring systems probably about a year ago because it's always the last thing people think of, but then the first thing they need, um, right? So uh, we actually talked to our own ICT teams within the free ICT about developing a system. We looked at um, current systems and amendments. There's a system called Uniform, which we use in planning, which had a sort of a BNG tab that was added by the developer. And it, it, it kind of did the trick, but not really. So it's, it's been a, a, a bit of a tricky journey. Tomorrow, I can tell you, tomorrow we have a meeting with a developer who's um, produced some very promising software called Verna. Um, should I mention that? I'm not sure I should mention that, but anyway. Um, we, there we, are other firms available. There are other firms, of course, thank you. Um, <laughs> but we're meeting with them, I'm meeting with them with our ecologists to, to look at what they've got and to talk through it. It's been recommended to us by PASS, Planning Advisory Service. So we have, we have some hope. If that doesn't tick the box, there are others out there, um, other systems which we, we have also been exploring. Our ecologist has been talking with our Section 106 officers about some software that they've recently um, uh, purchased or are looking to, to purchase. So, yes, incredibly important, and we're doing everything we can to ensure that we're ready for day one. And the second part of your question was about baseline, I believe. Um, tricky one, uh, in as much as um, voluntary... So, the way that baseline data is collected is through something called the DEFRA metric. It's a standardized process that DEFRA have developed over the last few years. It's a very complicated, I mean, it's an Excel-based product, but, yeah, but it's very complicated. And really, to fill it in correctly and to, to understand what you're looking at, what it means, is it correct, you need to be a trained ecologist. We, we, and, and as much as citizen science has a role, absolutely has a role for us, going forwards, it, it's probably not this role. Uh, we, we, we wouldn't, um, yeah, it's, so, so the way that the baseline is recorded for BNG sites is that the developer would pay for their own consultant to do that baseline. Our role as a local authority is to check their work, right? So you have essentially two, uh, you have checks and balances. We have the developer saying, we think it's this, our ecologist team looking at that, doing a site visit and saying, okay, we agree or no, we don't. That's, that's how that system works. Yeah, thank you. I guess part of what I was trying to get at was if, if people try and fiddle the system a little bit and perhaps try and suggest that biodiversity is lower due to um, any sort of clearing or anything like that. In the, in the run up to their application. I, I didn't know if there was any sort of controls on that and that's potentially why I was asking about um, neighbors and other people and other ways of collecting data to kind of have an idea of what, what may have been there. Can I just sort of come in there? We've, we did bring this up when we were looking at the biodiversity supplementary planning document and I think we had a similar conversation. So I think it would just be good to confirm it though. And that that is, the baseline, as we understand, 
goes from when this came first to Parliament. So actually that is, what, what year did you say that was, which was? 2020, 30th of January 2020 is the baseline. But a point, the baseline is only there if there's a record somewhere of what was there since January 2020. So I think where um, Councillor Redrup is coming from is we know that for monitoring to be used by the planning system, it should be recorded with the, the Cambridge and Peterborough Environmental Recording Centre, which is based here in Camborne. And so what we were talking about is encouraging those who know that there could be areas that are destined for um, development to be helping and ensuring that there is baseline environmental data. So they could be through the support to parishes, there could be encouragement to citizens to upload to the environmental recording center rather than just between each other and to their clubs and monitor, you know, because that doesn't count unless it gets into where the planning ecologists go to. So if we can get that into the Environmental Recording Centre, I think that is where your question is coming from. Empowerment of people to make sure there is a baseline to some extent. Um, um, my question is that... Uh, Doubling nature proposal is talking about doubling the area uh, of semi natural environment. Uh, that was the, I mean, I went to the meeting that I went to um, Natural Cambridge, that's what they were talking about, is raising it from 7.5% to 15% of the area. So, so there's one, there's two, two types of, of net gain you can do. So one is improving existing sites, and one is actually uh, transfer, converting sites. And, and obviously, the uh, ability to achieve the the target depends upon which the priority goes to which. Is there any guidance about how that should be uh, directed? So, uh, yeah, sorry, great question. Thank you, Councillor Khan. Um, so my understanding is Dublin nature is not just about area, it's about quality. Yeah, yeah, yes. Right, so. Yes, but, but, but there was a specific target. That a was specific mentioned. target. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, but there was a specific target mentioned. Okay, from Natural Cambridgeshire. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. So Sorry. perhaps I can clarify from Natural Cambridgeshire Board. So there are multiple measures. Yeah. It's a mixture of measures. So some is area, yeah. some is quality, some is species, and some is habitat. So I think it's about a mixture of those. Through this particular, so biodiversity net gain will be like everything else in planning, context dependent. In terms of balancing and offsetting what the take is, the approach is not strictly like for like, in as much as if you're losing you know, a hectare of whatever kind of habitat, you need to replace exactly that hectare of similar habitat. But we are, the, the, the steer has been, remember the guidance isn't out yet, so we've been, we've been making this up as we go a little, but the steer from groups like the Wildlife Trust um, and Natural Cambridge has been that really the preferred option is that if we're losing land on calcareous grassland, then the mitigation should be as close to as possible where the harm has taken place. And so we've, we've, we've got priority habitat areas mapped, that's something that Natural Cambridge have done, and so we're using that as a guideline. It's, it's much broader than like for like though. I suspect I suspect that the government guidance will be in line with that. I don't have a crystal ball, but if, we, if we're forced down the like-for-like -like route, it's going to be quite tough mm -hmm. because, um, and yeah. you know, we've got the replaceable habitats, we've got all kinds of other stuff coming into the mix that's going to make it really difficult. So, in terms of prioritisation, I'm not. My answer is I'm not sure yeah. yet because there's a basic problem that uh, uh, some habitats take hundreds of years to develop, some take. Uh, you know, you, you tend to end up getting a lot of wetlands because they tend to develop relatively rapidly. Uh, uh, you know, a mature woodland takes hundreds of years. So it is a problem. Councillor Heather Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> and I have to say, I, I think on your presentation, you said about how there's, there's a very big um, thought process and it's high on people's priorities around here about the environment. 
Um, and on the presentation, there was a picture about Save Our, our Green Belt. Obviously, that was a protest against a busway that is being supported by this council. Um, so that, that sort of uh, triggered me to think, where is the priority in the policies on preservation? Because we all want better environment, better quality, we want net gain. But um, I've sat on planning committee and been thoroughly frustrated when people say, well, we're going to, I think we had an application sort of born Caxton area and they were going to offset it in Fullbourne or, or vice versa. Um, now, with, with best one in the, in the world, they're not going to be able to gather all of the animals, the insects and everything and, and displace them to Fullbourne. Um, so where throughout these policies, I'll say, given, given the example there of the engagement on against nature, which is this council's policy to have the busway, where is that balance in the policies on preservation, sort of in the hierarchy, looking at the net gain? How, how is that tightrope being managed? So the mitigation hierarchy, which is in um, all of the documentation that we either have signed up to or taken guidance from, says, First, do no harm. Mitigation hierarchy. If you can do it somewhere else, do it somewhere else. If you can do it somewhere else. And then there is a hierarchy of, if you're going to do it here, if you must do it here, then you know you need to take these considerations um, in hand. With regards to um, the balance of, I think what you're asking is off-site versus on-site, because you mentioned Fullbourne. So what's happening in Fullbourne is this a strategic habitat bank, habitat creation bank. From the planning side, we recognise that the logistical practicalities of delivering net gain, and I'm not talking about green infrastructure, I'm not talking about the difference between those two, I'm happy to do that, but net gain, which is primarily for species, is not always going to be, in fact, very rarely are we going to be able to deliver net gain on site. So then you have the question of, well, if we can't do it on site because the developer wants to maximise their profits. That's the viability question. What do we do? Well, we look locally if there's a site to deliver uh, the, the offset locally. But what are we talking about? We're talking about a site that has to be managed for 30 years. It's going to be funded. Many parish councils aren't set up to do that kind of stuff. They'd have to bring legals in, cost money. And so the idea of having a strategic habitat bank within the district there's precedent for this already in law. Actually, within the county, there's precedent for this. Is that you can take the harm that's been incurred at site X and you can not just redress it, but you can add the net gain in another location. Now, I mentioned the Lawton view as well. What the Lawton view tells us is we want bigger, better, connected sites. If we had a, a policy that said, okay, in this location, we've got this harm, so we're going to do half an acre here and half an acre there. It would be unmanageable. Now, it might, and this is where the rub comes. Politically, that is an easier option. It's easier to sell to your residents. But from a scientific perspective, in terms of will that habitat be there in 10 years? Will it, will it actually be there in five years? Will it be, you know, gone? Um, it's, it's a much easier thing to do to put it into one location as a strategic offset site. But I just importantly want to say, that doesn't mean we're going to end up with urban developments which are just concrete because we haven't factored in the green infrastructure. Green infrastructure, soft edges, trees, amenity grassland, all the stuff that people need and want. But the biodiversity element, if you, if you, if you, if you wanted to put back water voles, you're not going to do it in the middle of Eddington. You know, it's just not going to happen. So there's, there is a balance. And, you know, it will work itself out. But I don't have a complete answer for you today, but that's my best shot. Okay. Jane. Perhaps just to add to that, because obviously... Oh, oh, oh. Um, so in terms of what existing nature sites, we have sites that are protected already. So if they've got those levels of protection, that obviously has a high degree of weight. So if you're on planning committee, you're talking about from that perspective... That would be, you know, that would have high weight because obviously if there's something going through a SSI, for example, site size and special signals, 
So there are those, that's a consideration that you'll be familiar with as a, as a planning committee. So that's something else you need to be aware of in terms of how you as a planning committee come to do that balance. A lot of what we'll be dealing with is virtually every application from January onwards, with possibly the exception of householders, yeah. will have to go through this process of putting in an assessment, telling us what's on the site and what, how, it's, how that biodiversity net gain, that 10% plus, is actually going to be met and where. So it's, it's quite a new I and mean, it's very exciting and the potential is great. Because of the amount of development we're obviously going to have within Greater Cambridge in due course, you know, it is quite it's huge areas. I mean, it's an, a huge you know, landscape opportunity to make a significant difference, but there will always be that weighing up, which will be in your hands as members on planning committee. Um, it's another consideration that you have to have. It's going to have a higher consideration, which is it's mandatory 10%, or it will be when it, you know, it comes in in January, but it will be for you to make that, you know, that judgment. Thank you. So um, thank you for the answer. And, and I think actually, I know this is the, the climate committee, but it's important that planning committee members and subs are fully briefed on this ahead of it happening, because I say we will be the ones that are doing that balance. And, and I'm just wondering whether part of the frustrations I've had in the past is we have planning committee. They say they're going to do X, Y, and Z. They do X, Y, and Z, but the maintenance isn't quite right. And then actually what we find is we've, it was, they've ticked boxes. They've said they've built, just keeping it really simple, they said they'd build 100 trees to replace the 20 trees, but of course the trees, like the A14, don't survive. Um, and I, So having it in these strategic sites, does that help with sort of the enforcement afterwards? And how, how long afterwards do we monitor the sites? to ensure that we've not sort of, to sort of um, fall, fall long out to red rough, sort of people doing things in a um, economical fashion, shall we say. It's one of the obligations that comes with us, to us as a council, when we make those decisions, will be that we have to monitor that. So that will be a requirement. So we will actually have to do reports back to Cat, uh, De DEFRA. We haven't got the detail yet, but we presume this is going to actually show how many of these reports you know, how many sites have we signed off? What's the management plan? So in reality, and we've talked about here, John's talked about Lower Valley Farms, so that's the first section 106 we've now got in place, and that requires them to put a 30-year management plan in place. Um, and the, um, the methodology, if you like, that we've put in place is that, that annual, re annual reports for the first five years, which is obviously where it's, the sites are really getting established, and our, our um, ecologists will be out there every year checking, you know, A, what their report tells us, whether it is on track to deliver that plan, but also physically going on site to double check as well. So we will have to do that. So it's quite, hence the quite a big undertaking that is coming our way, which is why we've got another ecologist already trying to get ahead of ourselves. So this will actually, again, excitingly, but an opportunity, you know, make sure that we are informed of that, because we've absolutely recognised what you say about this is secure, doesn't always often get implemented, and often on the greener side of things from the trees. So certainly in terms of ecology and nature, we're quite hopeful because we're actually it's, it's you know, the, the bones of what's being put in place through this new legislation is going to give us stronger teeth as a, and we're also expecting, the developers also have to pay for that as well. That's the other thing perhaps to yes. say. So actually there's a, a, a charging regime coming in. So we're not only charged, we'll be charging for the advice that we give as a pre-application stage, but the monitoring side of things, they are paying and that in due course will pay for our ecologists. So we've had to forward load it with a bit of money from DEFRA, but in due course, you know, development should be paying for that monitoring. Um, and you've got the resources and the plans for the resources. It's like you say, it's something more, so that it'd be self-financing, essentially. That's the plan at the moment. Obviously, we've done quite how many, you know, we, this is new to us, so we, we've tried to predict for the next few years, um, but we've absolutely got a second ecologist. And most of you will know Dan Weaver, who works for South Cams, and we've got Guy Belcher at the Cambridge City, and we've just taken on Sharon... Or Sharon Surley? Yardy. Yardy, as a second ecologist, trying to get ahead. Um, and again, to be fair to the government, you know, DEFRA has funded all, most local authorities to do that. Yeah. So every, every local authority in the country wants ecologists at the moment. Nice, someone's happy with DEFRA. That's good. I would just come in. What was, was very interesting in terms of the ecologists at an LGA meeting when the local authorities were saying they all needed ecologists and there weren't enough ecologists and they couldn't get ecologists to go to local authorities. And um, I do remember an officer from this council standing up and saying, well, in South Cams they've come because they've got an amazing package in terms of work-life balance. And we've got one of the ecologists in the country coming to South Cams because of the four-day working week. So that's very interesting that we were able to be more competitive across all local authorities for a very limited pool of ecologists. So that's really good. Um, I can see that Councillor Warren Green's got a hand up. 
Yeah, I, I have a question about um, really interesting report, thank you, on activities and actions. You've also mentioned that outcomes is going to be part of this, and I think we've sort of like talked a little bit about how you're going to monitor it. I'm just wondering at what point will we see what the criteria is you're measuring against, what the outcomes are going to be. It, um, my question is because my parishes ask me, you know, they can see this activity happening, so it's, it is visible, which is great, but it's what are the outcomes of the work that's being done um, at the moment? So, uh, yeah, I didn't really cover too much of that in my presentation. I probably should have done. It would have been much longer, though. Um, so the monitoring, if I could take Low Valley Farm just as the first, because that's the first solid agreement that we have, so I can speak much more, you know, that's actually happening rather than a, it, it, you know, it might, but it may be. Um, the monitoring uh, that we've agreed for that biodiversity offset site, which should follow for, for any other, is um, it will be monitored for 30 years, in years, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30. Over those years, uh, the monitoring years, we would expect um, the, the agent, in this case, because the county don't have their own, that they're, they're managing it through Bidwells. I, I think I say that, yeah, okay. So Bidwells will produce a report in the monitoring years, which our uh, ecologists will check, not just through looking at Google Earth. They'll go and visit the site, they'll check the ground, and they'll essentially uh, test that the intention for the habitat um, its progress towards its desired goal. So 30 years, think about a 30-year woodland, what a 30-year woodland is going to look like. They will assess whether the trees are in good condition, whether they've died, whether that, and essentially what we're being told by the, um, the ecologists on site. So Bidwells will tell us, here's your report, we'll read it, we'll check it, do a site visit, and we'll grade it, we'll mark it. If it's not good, we'll feed back, and they have to obligated, they have to fix anything that's not as it should be. So in terms of different habitat types, as I think um, Councillor Khan's already said, some habitats come to uh, maturity much quicker than others. Woodlands take a long time, um, whereas maybe grassland quicker. So I don't think there's, uh, we, we can't say that, well, by year 10, we'll, we'll know it's all good. We'll have a good indication of where things are by year 10. By, maybe by year five, we'll have a a good indication of where the grassland's going. So um, the main point here, I'm probably not making very well, is that the local planning authority isn't just obligated to do this. Um, we have to report back to DEFRA um, on what we find. And so, that, again, there are checks and balances locally. There are checks and balances with national agencies and government to ensure um, that what's taking place is being... I think there was a question earlier about how is it going to be measured well, the defrometric is the only acceptable approach. It's not like um, in the past the developers have said, well, we've, we've done some calculations on the back of a bag packet, you know, and we, we think that it's this, that, and the other. It can't do that anymore. It has to be this uh, government-mandated tool, the defrometric. So that's standardised. The, the, the timeline is standardised. This is all wrapped up in the Section 106 agreement. It's about as watertight as it can get. Of course, you're dealing with natural stuff, so will it grow, will it die, you know, will trees be dead in five years? If they are, we'll know about it, and then the agents, the landowners, will have to make sure that that's replaced and actually is what they say it should be. Does that, that make sense? Just to add to that, so it'll be part of the measuring tools that you start to put into place, and in your report you have said, you know, you are going to be doing more um, sort of measuring and um, more technology around this. So it'll be, it, I, I look forward to seeing some of those outcomes coming through in that work. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Martin Khan. <coughs> well, there's, a, there's a couple of things, really. But the, um, first of all, regarding the ecologists, uh, actually, I was secretary of the group of local authority ecologists in Britain for 20, uh, 20 years, uh, 30 years ago. Um, at that time, there were about 100 local authority ecologists in Britain. There was still an organisation called the Association of Local Government Ecologists, which was the, uh, the successor of the one I was uh, um, a member of. Um, and um, hopefully they will now be able to uh, encourage more the, uh, that as a role, a professional role, a long-term goal. Um, now, secondly, I wanted to talk about an experience, uh, something which I thought in context with time, if one assesses how, how this proceeds, might be worth thinking about. Uh, I worked in South Wales, and 
uh, Glamorgan was the only county in Britain at the time which had an, a private act of parliament which allowed it to take, when open cast development took place, they could take a bomb, uh, well, coal development take, took place, which then, at that time, was quite active. Um, they could take a, a bond, and if the site was not, was, the main worry is that a company would go bust, and then they, they couldn't do the restoration afterwards, and so they can have a condition which couldn't be delivered. And they had a couple of really atrocious sites where that happened. Uh, so they, 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 they allowed to take a bond, and if the, if the company went bust or it wasn't delivered, they could go in and do it themselves with the money. Uh, and it, that worked very well, and it was lost when they had weak devolution because all the old acts were, were abandoned and they didn't have it, and now in any case nobody's developing coal. But I thought it was an interesting parallel which might be of interest in the longer term um, in terms of how you might manage um, long-term management of these sites because when you've got long-term management, the same sort of risks apply. Um, uh, and I thought it was interesting, but it had to be done by a private act of parliament which is a whole different procedure. Um, so I just thought you might bear that in mind as a to think in the longer term, not, not immediately, obviously, how you see how it runs, whether that might be a solution that could be adopted for, for this sort of management. Um, it's just a thought. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Councillor Jeff Harvey. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I was wondering whether a, a possible um, problem that might emerge with this is that for the biodiversity um, offsetting um, there might be a sort of optimal commercial solution if you like to to provide um, the biodiversity net gain credits um, but um, combining that with other income streams for example you could imagine that Milton Country Park is, is quite a good model because it's, it's woodland, it's got paths for people to uh, walk their kids, walk their dogs, and it's got a cafe, it's got a car park. So if that were being built from scratch, that, that might be quite a sort of um, interesting business model. But um, is there a danger that if, if that's the optimum point, we end up with too many of those kind of places where, and, and we end up with no meadowland with food for pollinating insects, for example? Okay, so a, a, again, a very interesting question. Um, I think, so with Milton Country Park, I believe it's the only land, the only significant land that we, we own as a, a, as a council. Um, I've just been sat on this morning um, a presentation by Planning Advisory Service on um, how councils who own land can set up BNG offset sites on that land. And let me tell you, it's very difficult to do because you have to set up arm's length trading organize because otherwise we're marking our own work, right? And, there's, and, and, and there are rules about this. Um, so local authorities that have land holdings and are using those for potential offset sites are having to jump through all kinds of hoops to ensure transparency, to ensure um, that, that you know, it's, it's in line with the, with the legislation. Um, much better, I think, better, is that a term I can use? M much better, I'll use it anyway, much better that someone else is taking the risk. So with Low Valley Farm, the county council own the land, and for whatever reason, they've decided to employ an agent to do that all the ecological baseline and monitoring work. So we're in the sort of three-way agreement. We have a section 106 agreement with the county, which uh, brings money to us uh, for the, the, the monitoring work that we do. Um, and covers the, the officer time. The county take the risk if it all falls over, and I don't know where bid rolls are in it, they're employed by the county in whatever agreement they've, they've got. But that, that's the model we seem to have um, there. I, I have often wondered about Milton Country Park, if it could be better used, is that something I can say? I'm not sure. Um, but potentially used in a, in a, in a different way to, to benefit biodiversity, and not just the, the sports side of things. But probably said too much of that as an answer. Can I just come back quickly on that? Oh, yes, Chair. I, I, I was really using Milton Country Park as, as an example of something that could be created that would be viable as a business that would bring biodiversity net gain and other income streams. Um, so really my point was that um, if, if that's the optimum, 
everyone would do that, but we wouldn't get meadows full of um, you know, food for pollinating insects, for example, because that's not as good a kind of business proposition in terms of utilising land for biodiversity net gain purposes. Well, I suppose there's a range of things happening. I mean, what we're talking about here is through the planning act, planning process and what needs to happen this way. You've also got a whole range of players in Great in Cambridgeshire. So you've got wildlife uh, bodies, you've got um, you know places like um, you know the, the Wildlife Trust, you've got CPPF at, at Coton who are doing that, and obviously they're yes they want they need to be commercial, they need to be sustainable, but actually they've got nature in in, in heart. So that you'll always have I think that aspect. Um, um, and actually, from our point of view, I suppose the other thing, so I'm going to jump about a little bit, um, we've also got the nature recovery um, strategy. Yes. So actually, in addition to what, the, what we're talking about, at a county-wide level, there will be a plan coming into being, which has very much got nature in its heart, saying, you know, what have we got, what should we be doing, what we should be aiming? So all of these things will come together. So yes, there may, may well be landowners that might wish to, um, you know, make a business case from from nature effectively i suppose our role will be if that's offered to us for offset offset it can only be on the basis of you know what what's it, it's got to match what we what we, what we need and what's well, what's being lost on this side so that side of things will happen but there are other players in there um and actually you know we need we'll need a lot of this these sorts of sites there will no one site will be sufficient so although we're very pleased that we've got this pilot with lower valley farm you know we are going to need considerable considerable number of those um, thank you. Um, Councillor Brian Milnes. Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, I've got a, a question um, or um, an observation about uh, issues that came up recently in my um, local uh, district. So we had a problem with a new development uh, and the Section 278 uh, agreement with the highways called for the removal of part of a hedgerow uh, to allow visibility um, onto the uh, road adjacent to the new development. And uh, their requirement was to cut this hedgerow down to 200 millimetres, which is very short. And there was a, a bit of a public outcry over this. Um, there was some uh, peculiar uh, issues that were raised because it was a de-restricted road, uh, but now is a 30 mile an hour zone and the, dis and the visibility display lengths have to be considerably larger for that. So there was more of the hedgerow that had to be removed. And what I was wanting to talk about uh, very briefly uh, was the relationship between um, County Council and our um, newly acquired uh, ecology officers in regard to biodiversity in that game. And uh, I, I, I really um, advocate for a closer working relationship between uh, the County Highways team who instruct on these issues so that they can take biodiversity and net gain into serious account uh, while uh, demanding uh, developers do certain uh, activities that um, actually create a loss of, uh, loss of nature uh, or uh, natural habitat. Um, so that's really, uh, or, um, I'm just advocating a closer working relationship so that uh, these uh, issues are tackled ahead of time rather than after, after the event. Thank you. Thank you. I can, I can answer that. Um, so the county do have an ecologist, uh, Deborah Ahmed, who we meet with regularly. Um, and in fact, uh, Deborah set up a, a, a group of local authority ecologists, and we meet to talk about well, it's been biodiversity net gain actually mostly over the last year um, and in those meetings um, you know different issues are highlighted and everybody you know gets the chance to wear what's going on in their patch how it's joined up so absolutely take the point that working together with other local authorities where we're stronger we're better informed um, and ultimately we have better outcomes um, i would say on the county highways piece i've got to say something about that as well is that recently there was um we identified a, an elm tree in booksworth which was due to be felled um, by the county um, and elm trees are and this one's a particularly nice specimen um, because it, it it was it had dropped limbs and it was deemed as a, a risk to this that and the other so uh, our tree officer got involved we instructed the county to not 
chop the tree down, we put TPO on it. I think we put TPO on emerging people, uh, TPO. We had the tree um, tested for uh, infection and it was found to be um, decayed, but not to the point where it needed to be taken down. So this is, this is the, the, the point I'm making here probably poorly is that the county were ready to swing the chainsaws and just make it happen because of the risk, the perceived risk to the highway, to, to, to life and limb. But actually just a little bit of work and a little bit of further investigation revealed that we could keep the tree, maybe do some crown reduction, you know, but keep the tree. Um, so th there, is a, there is currently a lack of join up, even within, and I can't, I can't really, it's not fair for me to speak for the county council, I'm not a county council employee, but I think that some more join up within that authority would be beneficial how we um, facilitate that I'm not sure but um, yeah so so on this if I can come back on that in, in, the the officer uh, involved at the uh, Cambridgeshire uh, County is David Allett um, who is assistant director for highways and transports and he's written um, some notes up after a conversation uh, following the incident that I referred to before. So perhaps I can uh, direct uh, our officers to have that conversation with him. Um, the other thing that I briefly would like to say is you mentioned trees. We've got a, a very good example um, in the development of the genome campus where they are translocating live trees in quite large numbers. And we've seen as well across our district and in, in the city as well, where uh, there's been um, much furore over the removal of trees for uh, road development. Um, whereas rather than fell them, actually translocating those trees to somewhere else, uh, or even alongside where they were previously is ought to be considered as a possibility of uh, retaining those uh, those mature trees that are so good for uh, the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Milne. And I think that would be especially around the hedgerows, because in this committee we have looked again at how important hedgerows are and how we can, through the planning system, our own planning system, but also highways, I think this would be a key one. Um, you know, in particular, I think at that time it was as whether or not this was nesting season, so had all things been taken into account. You know, and what's great is we've now got, you know, communities and community members who are out there being the stewards and champions of this. So I think it's it's internally to make sure that's that's um, happening. Thank you very much, Councillors. I, I would like to ask a you know a couple of questions. And um, Jane Green, you you mentioned this, which is I think it's going back to the the legislation and I think as, as Councillor Heather Williams said you know there has been um, have been warm words about DEFRA and we do think that we're going in the right direction here because before planning system just had no way of really making sure that environment was high up the agenda and in fact National Cambridge was created to make sure that environment and nature were higher up the planning agenda with teeth and this brings the teeth in but when I talk to ecologists, scientists, experts in this area, they really don't think 10% cuts it. That 10% biodiversity net gain actually gets us to serious protection and gain. That's why we've got 20% net gain. And I noticed in the report we've had today, there wasn't the mention of 20% net gain. Um, and, you know, what chance is there that we actually get a real a proper aspiration legally for something like 20%. What are we going to do in that gap? Where, where are our assurances as a council that we're putting 20% but the legal requirement is 10%? So where's the confidence for people in our system that we say 20% but what's going to come out? Not November now, but it's now going to be January and who knows whether it's January. We hope it's January. But what confidence can we give to our residents that when we say 20% we can require that in our new local plan obviously because we can't do it yet because nothing gives us it but we we are doing everything we're finding a lot of developers are actually obliging so can we just have a bit more confidence around that I can, I can speak a little bit to that um, when so the policy team obviously responsible for developing new local plan policy and I think if I was to wind the clock back maybe a year or so, 
the conversations we were having then about evidence bases and about viability, there was there was definitely some kind of like, are you sure that we, you know, 20% seems like a, that's completely changed. All the conversations that we're having with our policy colleagues now, as they are developing the new local plan policies to be tested through the process, are 20%. There's, there's no question, I, I'm not hearing it, I'm not getting the mood music from them that it's unachievable, that they're concerned that the evidence won't support that. So from my perspective, the colleagues that I'm working with, it's a given, that's what we're going for. Without want to be <laughs> doom and gloom, just, but just to give you, you know, there's a process to be gone through, members. So actually, your officers and policy are working on that basis. They're very clear what your aspirations are. That's their aim. We have yet to go through the full local plan process and examination. So, you know, just making it really clean. There will be developers that will come to the table at that point. It's still, you know, you know perhaps a year plus off that will be challenging that decision. If, you know, if that's a decision that members make, they will challenge it. So your officers need to make sure they've got the evidence there that can demonstrate that. So that's the process. And this happens on every single aspect, be it water, be it, you know, your 20% target, whatever. That's what's going on. I'm sure you're you know, familiar with it. So, so we're very clear. And as officers in negotiation, and a lot of, a lot of the, you know, at the moment, we've got our current local plan. We know what your what you're wanting as a members. We're really clear in our negotiations with developers that come in and say, look, yes, we know what mandatory is, or we know what the current situation is, which is it's got to have some mitigation, you know, some, some gain rather. We know it's going to be 10% from well, November, January now, but our members are here. <laughs> so we, we're having those conversations now because, you know, development takes a long time to actually get through a planning process, but even then to develop, into, to implement. So your, your officers are doing that. Um, reasonably successfully is my sense. I mean, what we've been talking today about B&G, et cetera, are tools, because even if you have developers that actually want to do it, well, where can they do it, et cetera? So the other bit of work we're also doing is being proactive in finding out where are those sites that they could do. So if they can't do it on site, so perhaps they can perhaps do 10% on site and they might need to do 10% elsewhere. Up until recently, there haven't been those alternatives. So we're actually also doing a lot of facilitating work and trying to promote. So we're going to be doing some obviously more training with the planning committee. Um, but we're, going to, we're talking to the development industry. We were talking yesterday with County Farm to say, well done, great, um, great lower, lower Valley Farm. What else is in the pipeline, et cetera? So again, you know, we are trying our best as officers to make sure there is a pipeline of sites coming forward. So that isn't either an excuse further down the line as well. Um, but it's, yes, it's just to make sure that you, you know, we're clear as officers what your aspirations are. There's a process we need to go through for our local plan. We're starting those messages now, even though the local plan is, you know, will take some years. Um, and also we're trying to put place, you know, tools in place or sites in place to enable that. Can I just, and the, the next one would be around, um, so you mentioned the local nature recovery strategy. And we know that in the, in the um, spatial strategy, yeah. alongside our emerging local plan, that we did a call for green sites. So we know that who wanted to sort of put forward green sites as well, like Lovell Farm or whatever, but also that there is the lower, the, the Cambridgeshire local nature recovery strategy is pretty mature, has been incorporated, but it has no material weight in planning. So triple SIs do, cons con you know, designated sites at the moment do. But when you showed that map on there, of our nature depleted area, and there are these areas that are absolutely critical, but actually don't have protection yet, even though they're in um, the Nature Cambridgeshire um, LNRS. But what I heard was that recently in the Lords, there was a, um, an agreement within the amendments to the Environment Bill to have it as a material consideration. So the MPPF will be amended to link and give so that when you're in planning, you have to take consideration of those sites that we are currently putting in our local plan for the local nature recovery strategy. So it was just, can we make sure that we're the kind of what, what the yeah what what actually comes out of the other end of the policy end when when the environment bill comes? Because I think that's critical. Otherwise, we've got so much time spent creating these areas, the maps, the whatever, but in the end, they have no weight. But I think they're going to have weight, which is really good. Yeah. I, I wanted to come back on this uh, early comments uh, about, uh, about, about the replaceability of, of, of sites again. Um, and the comment was made, for instance, about chalk grassland, replacing chalk grassland. Uh, in fact, chalk grassland 
No, calcareous glass and it's one of the most difficult to replace because it's generated literally over thousands of years. It, um, to give you an example, um, when, I was, when I was an undergraduate, I was at Sussex and we went to look at Lullington Heath Nature Reserve, a local national nature reserve, um, which is an area of chalk heathland. Um, but it included an area within the national nature reserve which had been cultivated. It had last been cultivated 100 years ago. But still, it was not chalked down, and it was completely different. It was, a, it was a old, cultivated land. So you can't just create chalk down, uh, calcareous grassland. It, it take, it's the soils that matter, and the soil has been completely... It's been cultivated, it's been destroyed. So this is a factor that I think we do need to take account of in, in terms of our policies, that there are some habitats which are more difficult than others. And chalk, calcareous grassland is probably the habitat which has been most hit in, in this area. I mean, it's, it's, in effect, a man-made habitat, but it's a man-made man habitat that we really value, and we've lost a tremendous amount. Um, so I, I think that, in, in terms of assessing our planning applications, we somehow have to ensure that this, this consideration can be taken into account, and I don't know quite how that might be involved in local, perhaps in the local plan, perhaps in the comments, but make, make it clear that there are... There's a, there's a categorization of the, of the type of habitat and, that, and the importance. That will be through the local... I think that's exactly what the local nature recovery exactly. strategy is doing. So, thank, thanks. Any more questions on this item? No, no, so, we, you know, the recommendation is for us to note this and to applaud the work you're doing because we, we know in a way you're, you're doing this at risk, which means, you know, yes, you've got the funding, but you're actually putting all the work in, applying for the funding, setting things up like the data, without knowing exactly what the rules are going to be so that we can be there and ready for it. And, and really, we just want to say thank you for that. And this is going to be a difficult area, and it's somewhere where I think everybody is committed to, to making sure that, um, yeah, we do double nature in this area, and so we, we actually do it right. So thank you very much. Yeah. And it would be very nice to meet our new ecologists. Um, so if we go to the next item agenda, which is a verbal update, um, and this is on climate risk and um, adaptation. So Alex, I think you're going to... Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, I, pro I propose a, a kind of short verbal update and I will um, bring back a, an update later on in the year. So um, climate adaptation really means the adjustments in how kind of communities, businesses and councils respond to the, the kind of actual climate change and, and the expected climate change to come. Um, and although there is kind of some crossover with um, aspects of mitigation when we're looking at that carbon reduction, there are some kind of distinct areas as, as well. So, um, and they're things around kind of climate resilient buildings, uh, preparing for sea level risk, uh, flood protection, wildfires, that, that kind of thing. And this is a, a really a work area that informs both um, business continuity, but it also um, supports that kind of policy development as well. So uh, a climate risk subgroup has been um, set up with all of the kind of climate lead representations from the combined authority, the local authorities, and um, planning authority colleagues as well, um, as well as NHS, uh, public health, integrated care system, uh, policy, uh, sorry, police and fire services as well. We had a, a kind of first initial workshop uh, back in July, um, just to kind of convene people, see um, the different kind of aspirations and the different kind of um, uh, kind of work that had been done to date by the different uh, respective organisations. And I think the, the kind of key findings were that, that there is this need for a, a kind of comprehensive and, and quantified evidence base, um, and that will be beneficial um, for both the council and, and other local authorities, because, you know, we're providing these vital services and we need to kind of make sure that there's the understanding of, of the risks from climate change to those services. Um, and a need for that kind of clear, consistent and quantified evidence base. So it, it was noted that you know, there's been quite a lot of uh, significant uh, areas of work done, particularly around um, local plan and um, evidence base as well, um, and, and lots of work uh, focused around flood risk in particular. Um, but having said that, we, we, um, the focus has been on responding to individual climatic events rather than actually looking at how that evolving business as usual um, service delivery happens. And it's a slightly different kind of um, uh, way of looking at things than I think we've done previously. So there's that recognition that actually we need to kind of widen that, um, that focus. 
Um, we had suggestions around um, you know, how we might go about doing this um, and what is needed. So uh, a kind of further granularity of the data that we already have. Um, looking at uh, different scenarios, so for example, um, you know, adapting to 1.5 degree temperature increases, right up to perhaps four um, degrees increase, and, and looking at a range uh, of, of kind of scenarios, um, undertaking the evaluation of, of that data to inform the risk, um, and then that will then inform the plans that kind of have to come from that as well. Um, and there were also kind of specific implications that we identified uh, along the lines of things like. Uh, supply chain risks, so key supply chain risks, um, what those localised impacts might be and how you might take a, a place-based approach. Uh, and also thinking about the skills and the capacity that we need in order to, to do this work as well and to, to do the plans eventually. So a first phase was proposed to kind of gather that existing information, ident identify the gaps and develop the, the kind of quantified uh, evidence base. Um, so the, the group are looking at doing some soft market testing to think uh, to kind of look at costs and think about how to scope and spec that piece of work and a request for funding has gone into the combined authority to, to kind of cover that work so the next steps are kind of really just to flesh out what that work um, looks like and um, we did identify that there's a range of stakeholders that need to be involved obviously it was just officers at, at that particular uh, particular point um, but the, the next stage is to kind of proceed with that wider stakeholder engagement and um, kind of drawing up what that specification of work looks like so that we don't duplicate what we've already got and we actually add value to it. Um, so yeah, so that's that's where we're at and I would propose bringing an update back in um, towards the kind of back end of this year. Any questions, I can happily take those. Um, as Alex, is a bit dear to my <laughs> So to, to me, this is about the the climate shocks that we can't avoid anymore. So this is about the heat waves, the flooding, um, the, the fires, the sea level rise that is going to happen anyway now because of climate change. And then the scenarios that you're talking about, whether we're going to be in a 1.5 degree warm world or not, are whatever we do now will impact what we're doing here locally, nationally, internationally, will impact those scenarios. But there are certain things that will just, they're going to be happening now. And they're already happening. So the NHS health alert that was out this summer, for the first time, the NHS has a health alert that says, because of the number of deaths due to heat stroke during the heat wave in 2020, the health alert says, this is telling everybody that the NHS, how much we might be overwhelmed due to the number of people who are suffering from heat stroke. And with elderly people, particularly in non-ventilated homes, that could lead, those could be fatal. And this is about, we get the winter overwhelming of the NHS. This NHS heat health alert that was out this summer, people thought it was about, oh, put your sun cream on. It was a heat health alert for the NHS, saying the NHS will be overwhelmed by this much because of extreme heat. And they're going to be doing this. And I think local authorities are on the front line constantly, business of continuity, but also through flooding, through things. It's the front, you know, it's the local authorities that are on that, that front line. So when we've got our net zero strategy and we have our doubling nature, I think there is a compliment that this comes in to say it's about reducing the carbon emissions and it's about what we're doing already to adapt and do those things. And then we look at what we may do above, over and above. But first of all, it's saying what we're already doing and recognising that already the council is doing stuff. So all the action to support people with their energy bills, insulation, all that is adaptation to you know, to climate change. So I think it's, it's bringing that together within our integrated strategy um, and how we do that with not burdening too much. But I think it's a, like you say, it's a packaging of what's already being done there. But the concern, obviously, and I have to say this, is the rowing back of net zero stuff. The number of people that have contacted me on that 
really concerned that we are going backwards on, on net zero nationally and what we can do with this. And businesses are also saying, we had this all planned and now we're going backwards. It makes it even more critical that we're working on what do we do with the stuff that we can't avoid because we're, you know, we're, we're going slow. But obviously, we're going to make sure that we don't row back on net zero. But you know, that, that's one of the things. So the other thing I'd like to link in with it when you talk about business continuity is with the council has done work with our business support team looking at how businesses can green themselves and look at reducing emissions. I think helping them know about risk and continuity. So how can extreme weather events or lack of resources like water or you know, other things affect their business continuity as risk? Once we've learned, maybe that's something to share with our business you know, community as well. Yeah, just to say, I mean, I think this piece of work that we do will be um, you know, incredibly useful for the public sector, but then also to have that conversation with businesses. And, and like we said, that supply chain, not just our side supply chain, but businesses supply chains as well and start to kind of, um, well, not start, but kind of increase that conversation because we'll have that really clear localised evidence base about what it means for us here. And we can then kind of uh, com uh, communicate that to businesses as well. So, yeah, definitely. Good. Thanks. Any more? So we just look forward when you come back with that. Thank you um, very much. Good. Um, so we just go to date of the next meeting, which will be Thursday, 7th of December. And um, we've already heard that part of that will be to hear the air quality um, strategy that city well, went to one of the city's committees just this week. And we're looking at a, you know integrated air quality strategy between ourselves and city. So we'll be looking at um, seeing that with them raising some of their air quality standards and thresholds. So that will be one of the items, as I understand, that will be on the, the agenda committee. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, members. Thank you, um, those online as well, for all the preparation um, for this meeting. Thank you.